I told you last week's message was a little bit heavy, and somebody reminded me, where's Joy? She said, we need to have some joy back in the house, so we're going to, a little bit lighter message, but I, I want to try to relay something that's been burdening me. I've shared this a little bit with the guys in our Saturday prayer group. I shared this with some of the high school uh, that were with me um, yesterday bowling, and it's kind of been a common thread in our home as far as devotions and even at the start of this year. And I want to kind of share with you my purpose for today. I would say back in November, maybe October of last year, I began to just consider 20 years of being in the ministry. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. And I don't know if you're like me, you kind of look back and you say, how were those years? Or in, in a sense, for me, what have been the results of the time I put into a bus route? Of the time I put into working with young people over the years? And I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not a big fan of the word depression, but I was pretty discouraged. Because I've looked back over 20 years, and I think 13 of those 20, I've been involved in a bus ministry of some sort. And I, I look, and I'm trying to see people who are next to me that I've been able to lead to Christ, see baptized and discipled. I'm just going to be honest with you. The seats are empty. And so I began to ask the Lord, Lord, I need a bit of encouragement. And, and this, this is cramming a lot of time and consideration into just what I'm trying to say today. It's, a, it's in a really a short amount of time. This this has covered some weeks of praying and asking God, Lord, I need a word of encouragement. I need something to say, I've tried to be faithful. I've tried to do what I'm supposed to do, and there's no fruit. Now, now there's a delicate balance here because I don't believe we should just talk about this one, two, three, pray, pray with me. And you, you, Are you kind of with me? You understand, you understand? But I do believe God wants us to have results in what we're doing. Do you believe that? I mean, if we're going to go out and try to affect people, for, the, for there should, we want to see something happen. I mean, I'm not going to go to the field and throw corn, uh, seeds in the ground and say, I hope nothing grows. So as we're in the ministry, I think there's a concept or at least a desire to say, I want to see something happen. Are you kind of with me? Okay, now, I, but I want to see God bless. I want to see God work in my life, in my, in my family, in our ministry, just like I think you want to. And so I said, Lord, I need something. And, and just after I began to pray and search and say, God, I just want you to, to show me something that you're with me and that there's been something. And I'd say a week after I really got serious about it, I had a phone call from a family of mine I used to pick up, 10 kids. And they said, uh, our dad just died, and we were the only one you could think, uh, we could think of to call. Well, that was an encouragement. I was at the funeral and got to give out some tracts. And then you'll see a, a man sitting with me in church. It was the last, last, I don't know, four or five weeks. He comes to Reformers now. But I spent many hours in his home. I could take you to home, his home in Wisconsin Street out in Hobart, where we used to spend lots of hours. I remember crawling over him and his wife on Sunday mornings to go wake his kids up and pull them out of bed. I remember banging on their windows, waking them up on Sunday mornings on cold days. And, and then, then they just disappeared. And I haven't seen them in 15 years. And I get a phone call. How's my best friend doing? I haven't talked to him in 15 years. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but they're in a bit of pretty bad times. But you know, the encouragement is they know where to call. They know who to turn back to. If you follow, uh, we're having a Bible study tonight, this evening. And now, guess what? I'm starting to work with his grandkids. Maybe I wasn't able to get to the kids, his kids, but maybe we can get to the grandkids. You follow? So, that's kind of the background for this message today. I'm not in a hurry, but I want to I ask a very pointed question as I get into this. And I want you not to yell it out. The answer. But I'm going to ask you something that to me is, as I ask myself the question, it's shameful. 
So I'm not preaching this to you. All these notes are looking at myself. So here's the question. Have you ever led a soul to Christ? Have you ever led somebody to Christ? The next question leads on, leads on, if not, does it bother you? I'm talk, yes, I'm talking to high school guys. Because we sit back and we talk about our salvation, but when was the last time you shared it with somebody else? We were talking about singing, God is so wonderful. Is he? I mean, when I was dating my wife, I talked to a lot of people about her. And I talked about how wonderful she was and all the love letters I got and all the fancy things that we did and blah, blah, blah. And we talked about it. That's natural. But have you ever led somebody to Christ yourself? If not, why? Again, this is on me. Because as I sit in church and I enjoy my wife and my children, where are the people that I should be leading to Jesus Christ myself and urging and encouraging and trying to help and having them sit there right? Is that not the Great Commission? Talk to me. Is that not what we're supposed to be doing? And so I guess while we're in college, we don't have to do that. We just wait till we're out into the ministry, then we can start leading people to Christ. Is that the, the attitude we should have? So if you have not led somebody to Christ, this is going to be my encouragement to, to you today. I've been stirred with this. I probably passed out more tracts in the last two months than I have in the last three years. Shame on me. But I can start. Excuse me, I was, we were talking about Becca Schwatter and, and my kids when they go candy sell with her. <laughs> and I'm not trying to pump her up. But you like to pass out tracks, don't you? Is it part of your routine? Did you do it automatically when you first, I mean, just when you were born, you were passing out tracks, right? No. Now, she's quiet. I say more in three minutes than she says in three days. <laughs> but I was glad that my kids have the testimony. When, when, when they go candy sell with her, she passes out tracks to everybody. Please don't, I'm not pumping her up, but I'm saying that's shameful to me because my title is evangelist. You know what that basically means? The bearer of good news. Well, I'll be honest, I'm shamed, John. And John, I guess I can hit both of you at the same time. But in your workplace... No, I, I, I try to consider you guys and you guys over here. Sometimes our whole family, we won't leave campus for a whole week. We're just here. In our, we're in this bubble. And so if you're going to be a soul winner, you know what you have to do? You have to do it on purpose. You kind of have to step away from your schedule and your regimen of things and your agenda. And I know it's difficult because you, you start class at 8 o'clock, you go till 5, you go home, you eat supper, you do homework, and by then it's 8 o'clock and you just want to just lay there. So I understand. But us, as we're training for ministry, what is the ultimate purpose of going to class? What's the ultimate purpose of going on the bus route? It's for us to be trained to get in our mindset. Number one priority as the priority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I came not to call the righteous, but what? Sinners to repentance. For the Son of Man has come for what reason? To seek and to save that which was lost. So at Culver's, there's a whole mess of people there, aren't there? Now, I'm not saying you jump up on the counter during the workday and say, I just need to share Jesus. I'm not saying that. Kayla, don't do that. At Strack and Van Til, there's a lot of people that come and go. And I understand there's limitations. I get it. But I, I guess my challenge is for us to get this in the forefront of our mind. It's easy to go on a missions trip to Mexico and pass out tracks because that's what everybody's doing. I've been there. I've done that. And in Africa 20-some years ago, I mean, we were into it for a month, but then I came back and I got right back into my routine and I forgot about souls. 
Because I have a schedule, and I have organization to do, and I've got a job to do, and I've got this, and I've got that. But ultimately, what is our purpose? To reach people with the, with the gospel. I've got all sorts of illustrations, but let's just lay the groundwork. Luke 15, verse number 1, the Bible says this, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Who's the him? It's Jesus. Notice who he's with. The down and outers. And you know what happens when he chooses to be with the down and outers? Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now, if we are criticized in today's society for eating and drinking with sinners, let it be okay, because that's what our Lord was criticized for. Here we are, many of us were raised in good, fancy, fine houses with godly parents, and we're going into some of these homes of these teenagers that you deal with, that I get to deal with in TNT, and you go in these homes. Let, let me encourage you, you that go to a nursing home on Saturdays, let me encourage you, sometime, somehow, some way, go visit some of the bus homes that you're maybe with on Saturday, just, or on Sunday, just go visit them. You know what that'll do? It'll, it'll change your thinking about that annoying kid on Sunday that comes to your class. Because you know why? You're in their home. And Jesus came not for the purpose of helping the religious and helping those that consider the, some, themselves righteous. No, he came with the purpose of reaching those that were lost, those that were sick, those that are, are, are well, don't need a physician, but they that are sick. And he makes it very clear. That was his purpose. And yes, even as he hung on the cross where I would have been griping and complaining and talking about pain and trying to get sympathy and saying, oh, don't you realize this hurts? And I had to stay up late and people were making fun of me. Amidst all that, while I would have been complaining, he was taking time to get somebody else. And he's criticized for this reason, eating and drinking with sinners. I told Joe, he, he got to experience for a couple of days what the real world's like, didn't you? It's a mess, isn't it? Do you know what those people at Jiffy Lube need? Jesus. Fast. You worked at Microsoft for a long uh, up in Canada, right? Is that correct? What do those people need? Do they need me to smile at them and high five? They need Jesus. And, and I was talking to Nathan a little bit about this yesterday. I'm super overwhelmed with the burden for our public school kids. We've got 23 buses that run. And we might bring in 50 to 100. How many go to Michigan City High School? 2,000? So we're bringing about four from Michigan City High School. We're not touching them. And we were in schools this year, some pretty nice guys, right, fellas? And I met some of their parents, I met some of their coaches, and you know, we had this mindset that we got to get them to Fairhaven. Can I change the mindset today? We got to get them to Jesus. They need Jesus. Let Jesus work on their heart and direct them where they need to go. And I'm burdened about this, and I want some of you to grab this burden, grab a bunch of tracks and say, I just want to be conscious when I go to the gas station, instead of just swiping and leaving, there might be somebody at the counter that just needs you to smile and say, hey, let me give you this track. It tells you about Jesus, and now you can know for sure you're going to heaven. But you see, you say, well, I, I'm in a nursing home and I don't leave campus. Well, do it on purpose. We get three-hour passes to go to Walmart. We get five-hour passes to go on an off-campus date. We get, and those are not bad, but can, why not get an hour to say, I'm going to go pass out tracks to people. <gasps> We're allowed to do that? Yeah. And when you go to the nursing home, there's people coming and going to visit others. Now, I'll be honest with you. I got I to gotta just, I'm transparent today. I might not even get the four points that I have to give you, but that's okay. Hope you get the point. I like to be around happy people. So if you're, um, like, depressed all the time, stay away from me. <laughs> or get happy. <laughs> I don't like going to nursing homes. They depress me. <laughs> and I'll say this. I think heaven is going to be one happy place. And if you don't like to be happy, you better figure it out because you're going to be somehow depressed in heaven. 
Because heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. That's why I don't sing specials. <laughs> I want to see my Savior's face. Why? Heaven's a wonderful place. And you read down to Luke chapter 15, and Jesus makes it very clear. Let's look at verse 3 and following. And he spake this parable unto them. So he's always using an opportunity to teach while they're criticizing. He says, let me share something with you. What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders. What's the next word? Rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, what's the word? For I have found my sheep which was lost. If you came to me and said, Brother Amos, I found my cat which was lost, I'd care less. I found my sheep. I don't like sheep. They stink. They're ugly. They're just, they're not, you know, I don't have a mascot say, we're going to be the fairy Baptist sheep. <laughs> so if, if a shepherd loses a sheep, I'm like, you shouldn't have been so stinking careless. Go figure it out and rejoice on your own. But he doesn't care. You know why? Because the sheep means something to him. And so it says in verse number 7, I say unto you, just like this shepherd finds a sheep and he calls people together to rejoice, he says this, or he says, likewise, or just like that joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Verse 8, we know the, the, the lady loses a coin. And verse number 9, and when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I had lost. Again, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels angels of God over one sinner, sinner that repenteth. Can I ask you this today? Do you know somebody that's lost? I'm a bit overwhelmed by Sebastian's parents we've been praying for. I don't know them. But to see his burden has caused me to have a burden. We pray for him every Saturday night, right? And we should pray for him more. But how thrilling it would be if tomorrow he came in, or Thursday, my mom and dad trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Would we say, why would they do something like that? No. A few weeks ago when my wife's grandfather, 93 years old, trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, I got this hunch that the angels flying around the throne for a little bit saying, holy, 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 stop just for a moment is... God looked over and said, choir, start singing. Orchestra, start playing. I don't know how that works. That's my version. You know why? Because there's joy in heaven over this one sinner that repenteth. Now let me ask you this. How much joy have you brought to heaven? Yeah, I'm talking to teens. I'm talking to college. I'm talking to myself. Because if Joy in heaven were relying on me, Daniel. It'd be like a nursing home. Because I haven't brought a whole lot of joy to heaven. But you know what? I make all kinds of excuses. But, but God, I preach and I teach and I do all this stuff. He didn't come to call the righteous. Are you with me today? How many of you are involved in a bus route? Don't answer this. I'm falling apart up here. but when was the last time you led somebody to Christ? Well, that's the bus captain's job. Yeah. My goal is this, to move us from being good visitors to soul winners. I like visitation. But you know what? That's pretty easy. The 11-year-old boy you dealt with on Saturday, that kind of made your day, didn't it? It really didn't matter who won the Olympics? If we could just get that burden, and God's working me over with the burden, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. But put yourself on the other side of the desk at the bank, and you don't know Jesus, you would want somebody to give you a track, wouldn't you? Knowing what you know. One person's important. 
But why is there joy in heaven? Well, we know based on the scriptures, because the soul is important. We put a lot of emphasis on the physical, don't we? Why in the world are there mirrors in the men's weight room? Let me, Luke, stand up for a second. <laughs> what a specimen. <laughs> but every once in a while, I'll slip up into the weight room and watch the guys lift. Some of them talk, but some lift. And, and I'll see as they grab those dumbbells. That's another thing why they call them dumbbells. I don't and they're like, you know, like for Luke, you know, it's little mosquito bite forms on his. <laughs> and we laugh. And it's fun to see them kind of grow. And then, you know, they're growing physically, but they need to, like, upgrade their shirts to kind of, like, match that. Because it's like, they're like this. It's like, yeah, this shirt was when I was five years old. <laughs> but we put a lot of emphasis on physical growth and ladies maybe it's fashion for you and like how do I look and how does my hair and how no, that's none of that's wrong but God really emphasized the importance of a soul what that the prophet if a man shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul that's why there's joy in heaven because when somebody repents their soul is rescued you with me that brings joy to heaven. Number two, why is there joy in heaven? Because of the increase of heaven's population. Now, now think about it for a minute. I've never known, and I have to say this carefully now because the way our world is, I've never known a good family that hasn't been happy for the birth of a new child. Nowadays, abortions run, people don't want kids. It's, that's the unnatural affection that's in this world today. But when we were going to have our first we didn't go to the doctor and find out if it was a boy or a girl. We wanted the anticipation, the surprise to be there. And so we waited and we waited and we waited. And I was kind of like, I want a boy, I want a boy. But I don't want to say it too much because I don't want to be disappointed. Sorry, girls. I just, you know, I kind of wanted my boy. And so, I don't have time to tell the whole funny story, but it's a pretty funny story. Back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. Okay, so this is back just 15 years ago, but I didn't have a cell phone. And so I went out bus visiting, and I was on a visiting, and my wife was, obviously she was great with child, so I didn't have her out on the route, because I didn't want to do like the car bird thing, you know. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't trained for that. <laughs> and so I get home, it was probably 5 o'clock on Saturday, and I come home, and the house is empty and quiet. I'm like, okay, it's kind of boring, my wife's gone. And so I'm just going about my business. We had fall push the next, or uh, the anniversary Sunday, so we had tacos to make and nachos and cheese and all that stuff. I don't cook, so I'm really up a, up a creek right now. I'm just like, she's not there. I didn't smell the smell of ground beef and blah, blah, blah. And so then I drive down to church looking for my wife, and I think that Mrs. Armacos said, so did she have the baby? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, she went to the hospital three or four hours ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I get in my car. I go like 300 miles an hour down the road. The hospital was a lot further away than it is now. And I remember going in, and I'm like, I go to the emergency room. I, that's just, I just thought that's just the way it was. I go to the emergency room, like, is my wife here? And no, she's not here. Uh, they looked and found she's up in a room. So I go sprinting up, uh, finding the room. And I go in there, and she's just laying there peacefully. Like, did you have the baby? She's like, no, I've been here for a couple hours. I mean, it's my first time. I didn't know what was going on. Finally, time came. And Gideon was born. And after that, I'm like. <laughs> all of this to do? All this expense? For this? <laughs> this isn't mine. <laughs> I'll never forget calling Monterrey, Mexico. About 30 hours from here. Calling my in-laws. <laughs> And they got in this little tiny Pujo, that was the name of their car, Pujo, and drove from Monterey all the way to Indiana to see that. <laughs> I remember my wife just, the floodgates of visitors came. I'm like, I got to go. She's got to play. I went and play basketball or something. I don't know. <laughs> you can tell her about it. She's bitter still. Um, but the point was, there was joy 
in the increase of our home. And since then, Titus and Marissa and Karis has all been a wonderful blessing. You know what? The same way with heaven. When somebody says, I want to accept Christ, heaven's population has increased. It's pretty exciting. So you have the importance of a soul, the increase of heaven's population. I won't dwell on this, but I call this the investment of the Savior. There's about 50, 75 people taking the Dave Ramsey class right now. And my wife's like, we're just waiting for the session on investments. So the $3 allowance I give her every month, she can put it somewhere. It will just grow and multiply. If you have a good investment, you're going to be pretty happy about it. You're going to say, huh, I only made a million dollars last year. What's up? And I'm in Bible college. I mean, what is wrong with this? No, you're going to be pretty excited about it. I'm not going to dwell on that. But I'd like to just ask you to turn to Luke 16, and this is where I want to dwell for the last few moments that I have. You know why there's joy in heaven? Not only because of the importance of a soul, the increase of heaven's population, the investment of the Savior, but because of the reality of hell. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. You know the passage, but Jesus makes it very clear. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. We know the story. The dogs came and licked his sores and he desired simply the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and, and was buried and it continues on to say, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and he seeth Abraham afar off and says, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things and now he is comforted and thou art tormented and beside all this there is a great gulf fixed. The rich man says, oh, please send Lazarus back. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. But he says, no, they have Moses and they have the prophets. They're not going to believe if someone came back from the dead. And I see a rich man burning. He becomes a passionate soul winner. If I were the rich man, get this last thought. If I were the rich man, I'd be begging and pleading for a way of escape but he must have had the understanding, I'm not getting out of here, so I'm going to do everything I can in my power to stop people from coming. The reality of hell. Twenty-some years ago, my dad was on his way to hell. And as I was a little kid, I would raise my hand as a kid, Lord, help my dad get saved, pray for my dad get saved, pray for my For years we prayed for that. Then he was invited by some of the men in our church to go to California to climb a mountain. And again, I have to make the story short. And Cooper, I got serious about praying for my dad. For the first time in my life, I started to pray for my dad seriously. About two or three other guys, we got together and prayed before school. I was a junior in high school because I didn't want my dad to go to hell. I was serious about it, but I still kind of wanted to be on the punk side of things. So I got kicked out of Fairhaven Baptist Academy, kicked out of the youth group. Sound familiar, guys? And I remember sitting in, in our youth pastor's office, our pastor's office, and my dad was sitting there behind me, and they basically said, this is what Eric's did, done, this is what the, the, the punishment's going to be. And my dad said something along these lines. I don't remember exactly the exact words. He says, Eric, after all the sacrifices I've done to put you in a Christian school, I'm never coming back to church again. May not mean a lot to you, but the Holy Spirit hit me like never before. Says, "You are going to be the cause of your daddy going to hell." Changed me. God began to work me over, like He's doing right now, currently in my life, and I began to pray, "Change me, change me, change me." My dad was invited to go with some men in the church that were going to go climb Mount Whitney, 1994. Two groups were going. My dad chose one group 
to go on, and I was praying. I got sick. This is the time. I believe God was going to do something. About a week before the trip, I was working, cleaning, working midnights, cleaning the grocery store, and me and another guy were there, and we are mopping the floors, buffing the floors, and I hear banging on the window about 2 o'clock in the morning, and my dad, my mom, and I think one of my siblings, maybe both my siblings were there. They said, your cousin Damon was just killed in a car accident. And I knew just then we're pretty close-knit family. My dad's not going to go on the trip. And I just began to say, God, why? God, why? God, why? This is the time. He chose not to go. And again, long story short, I remember going to the funeral, and uh, my cousin was a year older than me at the time. He was just finished some basic training. He was getting ready to go to the Navy SEALs. Came home for a three-day leave. They started drinking at a party there. You know, he got drunk. Went to his siblings. Hey, give me the keys to my motorcycle. They wouldn't do it. One of his sisters slipped him a key to his motorcycle. He jumped on a bike, Hobart, Cleveland Avenue in Hobart, Indiana. He jumped on a motorcycle. 80 miles an hour, 35 miles in a zone, van backed up, boom, gas tank exploded, he was killed, she survived, believe it or not. Went to the funeral, saw lots of weeping, lots of drinking, believe it or not, lots of crying. His dad came to the funeral drunk, fighting over the flag of the, that the Navy had given. It was a mess. My dad sat through, I saw, I've seen my dad weep twice in my whole life, that was one of the times. But I was angry at God, because I was serious for the first time. God began to work. Somehow, my dad was able to switch his work to go on the other trip with some of the men in the church. He went on that trip, climbed Mount Whitney. I got a phone call right outside where that track rack is. It used to be a payphone. And I'll never forget, he called on that payphone, August 23, 1994. Hey, Eric, how you doing? How's the trip? He said, you wouldn't believe what happened. He said, I got saved. I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Let me tell you how it happened, though. I said, Dad, what happened? We've been pleading with you. Why? He says, I was laying in my tent halfway up the mountain. He said, I saw a picture of your cousin Damon's face in flames. Flames. Saying, Uncle Bill, you don't want to come to this place. He said, I got up, went to one of the men at church. I trusted Jesus Christ my Savior halfway up the mountain. You talk to my dad, he'll have a picture of Mount Whitney in one of the little rooms, and he's like, that's where it happened. But he saw the reality of hell. And until we get to see a reality of hell that Jesus lays out for us, we'll never have that burden. And it's a great story to tell, but it was 20-some years ago. And Dr. Mitchell asked myself, why, why is the zeal gone? Too busy. i got a schedule to keep. i got to work out. I want to have part in bringing joy to heaven. And can I beg and plead with you? Jump in now. That's the impact that you're going to make on people is not being a friend, but leading them to Jesus. Let's not worry about building our little church. But you know what little Stefan needs on your bus ride? He doesn't need to be here. He needs, he needs Jesus. And I'll be done, but I'm, I want to get in these public schools and I want to see God begin to work. And I'd like some of you guys to join me and see people being saved. I'm not talking about numbers. Talking about souls. That's my burden. More than ever before. Can we get a stack of tracks? Can we all do that? You say, I can't talk. You can start there. If that was Jesus' purpose, I want that to be my purpose. I hope this can help. I, I, I'm scattered. I got all kinds of things I'd like to say. But I'm preaching at me. Because I am a visitor. Is there a need for visitation? Yes. But I want to go from being a visitor to a soul winner. When was the last time you led somebody to Jesus? I don't know. 
Some of you guys are afraid to pass out a track. Well, if God is so wonderful, you might want to tell somebody. I'm not trying to be rude and crude. This is just, this is what I've been getting, the Holy Spirit's been beating me down with. And I thought maybe if I shared it with you, it could be an encouragement. I love when testimony services come, people get up and say, man, I was able to lead somebody to Christ, or somebody gets up and said, somebody led me to Jesus Christ. You can't beat that. So when you're tempted to criticize and complain, let me help you. When you're murmuring about this, go witness to somebody. It'll change your whole mindset. 